now the final speaker for 2019. Arvid, thanks. Woo All right. Uh, my name is Arvid. Uh, I'm going to talk about the C++ memory model. Uh, an intuition is the subtitle, um, which basically uh, is a way of suggesting that I'm not going to have any quotes from the standards, and this is not going to be deep dive. This is going to be sort of how uh, one can think about the simple uh, parts of the surplus memory model. Um, and before I get started, I want to add this disclaimer that if you're reaching for uh, atomic operations, you might want to consider first aiming for not sharing data between your threads. And if that's not working, the next resort would be uh, just use the mutex. They often perform really well. And then if you really need to, then, uh, then you can use atomic operations. Uh, but you want to be careful because if you do, uh, your performance may suffer if you're not careful. So, so always, always um, measure. So. Atomic operations, they are all about synchronizing memory that isn't atomic between threads. So, uh, and in addition, they make sure that the actual reads and writes to the atomic variables are not torn and don't like overwrite each other. So they are synchronized, uh, serialized. Uh, but more importantly, it's the other memory that isn't atomic that is the most interesting thing to talk about. So that's the regular memory, right? non-atomic writes. Uh, so when we use atomic variables or atomic operations, we are saying things about all of the other memory that we may have written to or may want to read from. Uh, and that's uh, what the interesting uh, aspects are. So it's uh, communicating with other threads. Uh, and obviously, if you have a data race, none of this applies, then you have undefined behavior. So uh, we'll touch a little bit on what a data race is, but basically you have to follow the rules. Otherwise, uh, you don't get any of the guarantees. So let's talk about memory order. So the atomic operations have different sort of modes or memory orders, as they are called. So we have sequ sequentially consistent, we have acquire, release, and relaxed. Uh, and there is another one called consume, but we don't talk about it. So I will not talk about it. Uh, so let's see, uh, acquire and release. I'm going to start with those. Why are they called acquire and release? Uh, you can kind of think of them as, as a primitive that's used in a mutex, or at least in the similar way as a mutex uh, would be used. So you acquire a mutex, and then you release a mutex. And what happens when you acquire a mutex and when you release the mutex? Other than getting mutual exclusion, there are some other things that happen. When you release, you uh, publish all of the memory that you have changed within your critical section so that it becomes available to other threads. And when you acquire, you uh, sort of pull in or make it available to you uh, the memory updates that have been made by other threads, that, that have been released by other threads. That's what acquire means, so you acquire memory. So going back to this analogy, so acquire updates from other threads, that would you, that's what you do when you acquire the mutex, and release updates that this thread has made to other threads uh, when you release. So while you are in between here, before you publish your changes, they will not be visible or may not be visible to other threads, uh, but they will also probably be data races if they uh, were tried to be uh, looked at. Um, and, and also important, after you publish them, they don't automatically become visible to other threads. The other threads have to acquire them for them to become visible. So there's this pair, like one thread releases, the other one acquires, and then you have communicated uh, this uh, the memory. So to illustrate this, let's say we have two threads. This is sort of my mental model. We have two threads, A and B. We have memory in the middle, and on the sides, thread A has its own memory, and thread B has its own memory. 
So thread A starts writing. These are regular writes, regular memory stores, nothing atomic about them, to its memory. Uh, but then it performs a release store operation. So this is an atomic operation. And the release store becomes available uh, in the main memory to other, uh, for other threads to access, to read from. Uh, but in addition to that, all of the memory updates, all the writes that thread A has ma made now become released to the main memory. Thread B then executes a load acquire. So it's loading from this atomic variable. The blue one is the atomic variable. Uh, so its value becomes visible to thread B. But in addition to that, all of the other uh, memory updates that thread A has made will also become visible because it acquires that memory. Yes. Just clarification. This is the memory model. It's not the physical memory that is promised to be written. It could still be in cache or. Uh, I'm not entirely sure I'm following the question. So clearly, in real life, thread like the memory isn't duplicated once per thread, but in theory, it could be. That's basically the mo the model is basically. Let's assume that every core has a cache that's th the size of the RAM. You know, in that case, this would be the case. This would happen. Uh, so things will probably, you know, sometimes be flushed. You know, and shared between them, but you're not guaranteed that they are until you release yeah. or, or until you acquire. So, uh, and now let's move on to a slightly updated example or a, a, a different scenario. Now thread B overwrites this, this uh, piece of memory, makes it red with a regular store. This is not atomic, regular store, regular memory. Uh, something interesting happens then. That memory now becomes like a, a death trap for everyone else on the system. If anyone even looks at that memory, you have a database. In fact, if anyone had looked at that memory before thread B, just B, thread B thinking of writing to it, it would have been a database, right? Because those operations would not have been synchronized. Uh, but if thread B performs a store release to this atomic variable, it will release that write. Note that thread A, from thread A's point of view, it's still a death trap. It's not allowed to look at it until it performs a load acquire on that atomic variable because that will acquire that memory. One thing to point out is that uh, it's not sufficient to just load acquire, you also need to load acquire and see the write that B has made. You can load acquire all day and see the value that you wrote, uh, but then you're not synchronizing with the thing. It's, until you, it's not until you see the value that thread B wrote, that's when you know that the memory is available. Uh, so an example of this. Yes? Can you go back one slide? Are you treating the magenta variable here as some sort of garlic variable on the red and green ones? Yes. So Yes, the magenta variable is the atomic variable, and it was also the atomic variable when it was blue. Uh, I was kind of thinking of marking that somehow, but it looked ugly, so I didn't. But yeah, yes. The blue variable is atomic, and now it's magenta because it has an updated value. And the updated value is read by thread A, and then it can, uh, it can see the, the new value. So here's an example. Uh, let's say one thread creates a widget, which is complex object on the heap. Was, uh, you have a question? No. Okay. Uh, and it allocates some memory on the heap and calls a constructor that does a bunch of stuff. And then it gets a pointer to that object. And then it stores to an atomic variable saying memory order release. And any other thread that reads that one from that ready atomic variable will then be guaranteed that everything that happened in that constructor, all of the side effects, all of the memory that it may have touched, will become visible to, to that thread. For example, this is uh, how you could do that. You could have another thread uh, sitting in a loop, loading this ready variable uh, until it returns something non-zero. And as soon as it reads a non-zero, it, it's going to read that one that the other thread wrote, then it's safe to start using W. Like in this scenario, it would hand over ownership, right? So uh, of of the 
of the widget. So that kind of covers acquire and release. Here's an, here's an interesting example. Uh, let's say you're implementing a smart pointer. And in the destructor of the smart pointer, you want to decrement your reference counter and uh, by one. And if it returns zero, that means you were the last one to decrement it. And then you want to destroy the object called the, the, uh, the destructor and free the memory. What memory order do you want here? Do you want to acquire? Because the destructor will need the most up-to-date version of the object, or do you want to release so that you tell other threads that uh, you're done with the object and uh, they can decrement um, their reference count? Turns out that you want both. So there's another memory order called acquire release. Um, so uh, in most cases, whenever we really, uh, decrement the counter and it doesn't end up being zero, we want to make sure that all of the updates that we have made to the object that this shared pointer or smart pointer holds are published to other threads that potentially may want to, to uh, access this, uh, this object. But the one time we decrement and it turns to zero, we want to make sure that we acquire all of the changes that other threads may have done to the object so that we can safely call the destructor on it. So this is an example of, uh, of where you would need both acquire and release. So basically, acquire release, it does both. That's what it does. So now let's talk about ordering. Imagine we have three threads, and we have some silly programs that runs on them. What they do is not important. Uh, but what I, the, the point I want to make is that from like the traditional way of thinking of threads is that at least back when you had you know a single CPU and you time sliced uh, was like you have some kind of interleaving. It's as if they run all of these things happen in this order, uh, and uh, that doesn't quite hold, uh, right? So this this would be the you sort of pretend that the computer does one of these things at a time and they just happen in this order. Uh, when you use uh, acquire and release, there's no actual global ordering guaranteed, so Thread A, from thread A's point of view, it may look like things happen in this order. But from thread B's point of view, it may look like things happen in this order. And this can have subtle and uh, unexpected effects. So there's no total order of events. Uh, but from each individual thread, the order that it experiences are consistent with the rules. They just don't necessarily uh, they, they are not necessarily the same. Um, so, to make this a little bit easier for programmers to reason about, there's the sequentially consistent memory order. So, the sequentially consistent adds this uh, requirement that every thread experiences the same total order of all atomic uh, operations that are sequentially consistent. Um, this is actually the default in C++ atomic operations, so my, my little pseudocode over here was incorrect, right, because that's the atomic, so the default would have been sequentially consistent, but that, uh, that wasn't the point I was trying to make. Um, it is believed that this is the least surprising for users, uh, so it, that's why it's the default. Um, uh, what it does is, whenever you are writing to uh, a sequentially consistent atomic variable, it becomes a sequentially consistent release. Whenever you load, it becomes a sequentially consistent acquire. And when you do a read, modify, write, it's the acquire release uh, that's sequentially consistent. So a read, modify, write is, uh, for example, if you do a fetch add or plus plus or minus minus on something, uh, because you load it, modify it, and write it back. Uh, so just to be safe. So sequentially consistent is uh, the most reliable uh, probably the least error-prone uh, memory order you can use. So we've looked at these now. So we can just the query release. I added the query release. It wasn't on the first list. Yes. Uh, there is no locking. Uh, the typically, I mean, on normal computers, there's no locking. Uh, on norm, like normally, uh, there are hardware instructions that sort of lock in quotes for this one operation. So you 
can read modify and write back. Uh, so for, for fetch add and, and uh, fetch, fetch sub. And there are a few primitives that you can perform atomically. Um, so the, th the, the last thing, the, the last memory order is the relaxed memory order. And um, this is the most error prone and really, really the last, last resort if you really had to, to go there. But what it does is it, it guarantees you that it's safe from torn reads and writes and, and clobbered updates. So if you have multiple threads writing to it, uh, you know, they will happen uh, one at a time. Uh, but other than that, there's no ordering with anything. Uh, and no other memory is synchronized. As the examples I, I had earlier, memory would be synchronized and visible to threads. Relaxed doesn't do any of that. It's just this one variable that becomes visible when you, when you uh, access it. Uh, there's also, it's also not even ordered with other rela relaxed atomic operations. So you can imagine that uh, like a compiler optimizer like, loves to like, fuck with this. Um, or make your code not work as you expected it. So uh, to illustrate this, thread A writes some memory. This is a reg regular store, not atomic. Another non-atomic regular store and then performs a relaxed atomic store. Nothing happens to the main memory. Thread B reads the relaxed uh, atomic load, uh, relaxed atomic load, right? Reads the memory. It sees that value, nothing else. Uh, so about the only reasonable use case of relaxed atomics, you know, there might be more fringe cases, but if you're counting the number of some events happening in your program, and you don't make any decisions based on this counter other than, you know, may maybe flushing it or, s you know, at the end of the program or something like that, then it makes sense. If you start to make decisions based on it, then you start to introduce this dependency that may be risky. So for instance, if you were to take this example and change it to memory order relaxed, uh, anything that happens in the widget constructor uh, or like, uh, nothing that happens in the uh, widget constructor has to be become visible to to the the other thread here. In fact, the compiler can move the the store up b before it even calls the uh, uh, the constructor. Uh, question: So only this uh, the ready store is atomic. Uh, widget construction is not atomic, correct? Right. So even without the relax, isn't it allowed to move the no. So in the example I had earlier, where there was a, a release operation on the on the ready variable, uh, that prevents it prevents the compiler from moving things below it. Yeah, but and anything like, so everything about it, any instruction about it. Yes. Oh, okay. And okay. but but it's not just the compiler. It it has to go all the way. It also prevents the 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 memory cache hierarchy to make it look like something was reordered and it has and it prevents the CPU from reordering instructions that make it look like they reordered. So this boils all the way down to like instructions to to perform this. Um. So while you're uh, we're interrupting yeah. so what happens on the hardware level? Say you have ten uh, threads uh, uh, hammering on the same uh, variable with a relaxed increase, for instance incrementing a counter. Uh, will the cores like block and do some hardware signaling between the cores and then wait until everyone is done and continue afterwards? Or do you know what happens actually? Uh, I'm not really an expert, but I believe that something like that happens. Uh, basically, uh, I, think, I think you can lock cache lines. So if one core, core loads a cache line, it can lock it and tell all, everyone else, I'm locking this now, you're not allowed to touch it, and then it can do something, and then it can release it and then some other CPU is allowed to then pull it and it can lock it, right? So it's going to be very expensive. Uh, but, right. but you don't have a CPU instructions that you can address the caching infrastructure with. The caching infrastructure needs to make this true. Well, you have... I think there are you, actually instructions you, for manipulating the cache 
yeah, so the 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 uh, the read modify write, for instance, that needs to happen at an instruction level, uh, unless you have even lower level instructions that can say lock this cache line for me or something like that. But uh, my impression is that normally it's done with special instructions. So now, like rounding up uh, this talk. Um, some of you may know that x86 has an unusually strong memory model, or it has coherent caches, where even normal memory like loads and stores have really strong guarantees about this. Uh, and some of you may have heard or have made arguments saying, well, I'm only targeting x86, so I don't need to care about this memory model. I know, I know how my computer works. Uh, but I would warn you that the compiler may disagree with you. The compiler is also allowed to assume that you're following the rules. And it can reorder things if you're not careful. And if it isn't today, when you upgrade the compiler, it might. Uh, and also, obviously, Volatile doesn't do, have anything to do with synchronizing. Uh, but, but this is an unusually or unexpectedly uh, common misconception. So I want to bring it up. I had this moment a few years ago where I discovered that still, like in modern days, people were arguing that Volatile was reasonable to use for synchronizing between threads. So I felt like this guy on XKCD. So Volatile doesn't do synchronization. But wasn't there a convention that if you had the Volatile function overload, by convention, you meant that it was, so, and then you would do the synchronization under the hood? Uh, there's, a, there's an old Dr. Dobbs article from Alex Strandesco, I think in 2004, where he used a trick since volatile is unused for anything reasonable, he used yeah. it to mean that some synchronization. Un also unrelated, by the way. Yeah. Uh, so, in, in summary, uh, sequentially consistent is probably what you want. Uh, sometimes acquire release may be faster, but you have to be careful so you uh, reali like understand the ordering guarantees or the lack of ordering guarantees. Uh, if you're using relaxed, that's pro most likely a bug. And uh, if you're saying, but I'm targeting x86 or I'm targeting hardware x, then it's probably also a bug. Uh, and if you want to know more, Herb Sutter in 2012 gave a great talk, two, two parts talk uh, called Atomic Weapons. Highly recommend it. Uh, so I've sort of scratched the surface a little bit. There are many more. Uh, aspects of, of the memory model, obviously, that's quite complicated. If you want to learn more about fun, like fun parts of it, there's something called release sequences, which uh, is relatively new, I believe, which defines how sequences of uh, accesses to atomic variables uh, are guaranteed to be ordered. And there's also out of thin air reads. Um, I think that's mostly a specification exercise where according to the standard currently, things that shouldn't be allowed are allowed, but they don't happen in practice. Um, yeah, that's all I have. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yes? I was thinking about the relaxed counter. Could you make decisions on it if you have loose requirements, like uh, um, I would like to do something after I have had at least uh, this many uh, events. Um, or, is the, or is the counter still uh, not trustworthy? You could probably do that. Could you tolerate doing it many times? <laughs> uh, sorry? Could you tolerate doing your thing many uh, right. times? Right. Is the next question. Uh, yeah, it, it's a little bit hard to say. It's hard to. Uh, yeah, it's hard to say with certainty, at least, You'll whether you can. Time, <laughs> no performance to say uh, but but um, uh, I would say that it's not unusual that <coughs> you have some other kind of synchronization between your threads anyway at maybe a lower uh, time, like a longer time window, uh, at which point I believe that you're guaranteed that even the, the relaxed atomics will be synchronized, right? Because they will be synchronized just like all the other memory. Is it at least uh, faster? Um, depends on your hardware. The, the reason relaxed exists is 
not because x86, it's because more relaxed hardware exists that can do atomic uh, uh, writes faster. Which kind of hardware? Um, I think PowerPC and maybe Alpha. But wasn't uh, Herb talking about the next ARM instruction set? And then, yeah. Isn't it that here this year? ARM V8. Yeah. ARM V8 implements pretty much exactly the semantics that C++ yeah. defines, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> seven years. <laughs> right. Okay.